It's Matt, and tonight I have decided to read two more creepypasta stories for you. Um, while I originally only intended on reading Psychosis this month, um, the response to that video was excellent. was over, so I've decided to do not one, but two more stories today. The first story is called Abandoned by Disney, and the second one is called No End House. Now, uh, like the last video, just be warned that these are indeed, as the title may suggest, creepy stories. stories are a good deal more gruesome than psychosis was. So if you were too scared to sleep with that one, this might not be the best video to fall asleep to. But if you're interested and you'd like to stick around, I'll be happy to have you here. So let's get started. First one is Abandoned by Disney. Some of you may have heard that the Disney Corporation is responsible for at least one real, live ghost town. Disney built the Treasure Island Resort in Baker's Bay in the Bahamas. It didn't start as a ghost town. Disney's cruise ships would actually stop at the resort and leave tourists there to relax in luxury. This is a fact. Look it up. Disney blew $30 million on the place. Yes, $30 million. And then they abandoned it. Disney blamed the shallow waters, too shallow for their ships to safely operate. And there was even blame cast on the workers, saying that since they were from the Bahamas, they were too lazy to work a regu regular schedule. That's where the factual nature of their story ends. It wasn't because of sand, and it obviously wasn't because of foreigners are lazy. Both are convenient excuses. No, I sincerely doubt those reasons were legitimate. Why don't I buy the official story? Because of Mowgli's palace. Near the beachside city of Emerald Isle in North Carolina, Disney began construction of Mowgli's Palace in the late 1990s. The concept was a jungle-themed resort with large, you guessed it, palace in the center of the whole thing. If you're unfamiliar with the character of Mowgli, then you might better remember the story, The Jungle Book. If you haven't seen it anywhere else, you know it as the Disney cartoon from decades past. Mowgli is an abandoned child in the jungle, essentially raised by animals, and simultaneously threatened and pursued by other animals. Mowgli's palace was a controversial undertaking from the start. Disney bought up a ton of high-priced land for the project, and there was actually a scandal surrounding some of the purchases. The local government claimed eminent domain on people's homes, then turned around and sold the properties to Disney. At one point, a home that had just been constructed was immediately condemned with little or no explanation. The land grabbed by the government was supposedly for some fictional highway project. Knowing full well what was going on, people started calling it Mickey Mouse Highway. Then there was the concept art. A group of stuffed shirts from the Disney Corporation actually held a city meeting. They intended to sell everyone on how lucrative this project was going to be for everyone. When they showed the concept art, this gigantic Indian palace surrounded by jungle, staffed with men and women in loincloths and tribal gear, 
everyone flipped. We're talking about a large Indian palace, jungle, and loincloths, not only in the center of a relatively wealthy area, but also of a somewhat xenophobic area of the southern USA. It was a questionable mix at that point in history. One member of the crowd tried to storm the stage, but he was quickly subdued by security after he managed to break one of the presentation boards over his knee. Disney took that community and essentially broke it over its knee as well. The houses were raised, the land was cleared, and there wasn't a damn thing anyone could do or say about it. Local TV and newspapers were against the resort at the beginning, but some insane connection between Disney's media holdings and the local venues came into play and their opinions turned on a dime. So anyway, Treasure Island, the Bahamas. Disney sunk those millions in and then split. The same thing happened with Mowgli's Palace. Construction was complete. Visitors actually stayed at the resort. The surrounding communities were flooded with traffic, and the usual annoyances associated with an influx of lost and irate tourists. Then it all just stopped. Disney shut it down, and nobody knew what the hell to think. But they were pretty happy about it. Disney's loss was pretty hilarious and wonderful to a large group of folks in the first place. I honestly didn't give the place another thought since hearing it closed over a decade ago. I live maybe four hours from Emerald Isle, so I really only heard the rumblings and didn't experience any of it firsthand. Then I read this article from someone who had explored the Treasure Island Resort and posted a whole blog about all the crazy things he found there. Stuff just left behind, things smashed, defaced, probably ruined by the disgruntled former employees who had lost their job. Hell, the locals from all around probably had a hand in wrecking that place. People there felt just as angry about Treasure Island as folks here did about Mowgli's Palace. Plus, there were rumors that Disney had released their aquarium stock into the local waters when they closed, including sharks. Who wouldn't want to take a few swings at some merchandise after that? Well, what I'm getting at is this blog about Treasure Island got me thinking. Even though many years had passed since its closing, I figured it might be cool to do some urban exploration at Mowgli's Palace take some photos, write about my experience, and probably see if there was anything I could take home as a memento. I'm not going to say I wasted no time in getting there, because honestly, it took me another year after I first found that Treasure Island article to get around to going up to Emerald Isle. Over the course of that year, I did a lot of research on the Palace Resort, or rather, I tried to. Naturally, no Disney site or resource made any mention of the place. That had been scrubbed clean. Even odder, however, was that nobody before myself had apparently thought to blog about the place or even post a photo. None of the local TV or newspaper sites had one word about the place, though that was to be expected since they had all swung Disney's way. They wouldn't be out there lauding their embarrassment, you know? Recently, I learned that corporations can actually ask Google, for example, to remove links from search results, basically for no good reason. Looking back, it's probably not that nobody spoke of the resort, but rather their words were made inaccessible. So in the end, I could barely find the place. All I had to go on was an old-as-hell map I'd received in the mail back in the 90s. It was a promotional item sent out to people who had recently been to Disney World, and I guess since I'd been there in the late 80s, that was recent. I didn't really intend to hang on to it. It just got shoved in with my books and comics from my childhood. 
I'd only remembered it months into my research, and even then it took me another few weeks to locate the storage bin my parents had shoved it all into. But I did find it. Locals were no help, as most were transplants who had moved to the beach in recent years, or old residents who just sneered at me and made rude gestures the second I managed to say, where would I find Mowgli's? The drive took me through an inordinately long corridor of overgrowth. Tropical plants that had run rampant and they overpopulated the area, mixed with the native species of flora that actually belonged there and had tried to reclaim the land. I was in awe when I reached the front gates of the resort. Tremendous monolithic wooden gates whose supports to either side looked like they must have been cut from giant sequoias. The gate itself had been gouged in several places by woodpeckers and eaten away at the base by burrowing insects. Hanging on the gate was a sheet of metal, some random scrap with hand-painted letters scrawled in black, abandoned by Disney. Clearly the handiwork of some past local or an employee who wanted to make some small protest. The gates were open enough to walk through, but not to drive. So, grabbing my digital camera on the map, whose flip side showed a layout of the resort, I set off on foot. The inner grounds of the palace were just as overgrown as the entryway. Palm trees stood untended and ragged among piles of their own coconuts. Banana plants similarly stood in their own stinking but riddled refuse. There was this sort of clash between order and chaos, as carefully planted rows of perennial flowers mixed with obnoxious tall weeds and stinking blackened mushrooms. All that remained of any outdoor structures were broken, rotting wood, and various charred bits of unidentifiable material. What was most likely an information booth or an outdoor bar was now simply a pile of assorted debris chopped up by past vandalism and ravished by weather. The most interesting thing on the grounds was a statue of Blue, the friendly bear from the Jungle Book, which stood in a sort of courtyard in front of the main building. He was frozen in a jovial wave towards no one, staring into empty space with a silly, toothy grin as bird crap covered whole swaths of his fur and vines and snared his platform. I approached the main building, the palace, only to find the outside of the building covered in graffiti where the original paint hadn't peeled and chipped away. The front doors weren't just open, they had been taken off their hinges and were stolen. Above the front doors, or the keeping mall where they had been, someone had once again painted, Abandoned by Disney. I wish I could tell you about all the awesome stuff I saw inside the palace. Forgotten statues, abandoned cash registers, a full-fledged secret society of homeless bums. But no, the inside of the building was so stark, so bare, that I actually think people had stolen the molding off the walls. Anything that was too big to steal, counters, desks, giant fake trees, they were all resting amid this empty echo chamber that amplified my every step like a slow rat-a-tat of a machine gun. I checked the floor plan and headed to all the locations that might seem in any way interesting. The kitchen was, as you'd imagine, an industrial food prep area with all the appliances and space, no expenses spared. Every glass surface was broken, every door knocked off its hinges, every metal surface kicked and dented. The entire place smelled like very old piss. <clears throat> the huge freezer, not even remotely cool now, had Hook 
sacks hung from the ceiling, probably for hanging cuts of meat, and as I stood inside for a moment, I noticed they were swinging. Each hook swung in a random direction, but their movements were so slow and small that it was almost impossible to see. I figured it had been caused by my footsteps, so I stopped one from swinging by clutching it in my fist, then carefully letting it go. The bathrooms were in much the same state as the rest of the place, just like the Treasure Island Resort. Someone had methodically smashed each porcelain commode with coconuts and other implements. There was about a half inch of rancid, stinking, stagnant water on the floor, so I didn't stay there very long. What's odd is that the toilets and the sinks and the bidets in the ladies' room, yes, I went there, all dripped, leaked, or just ran freely. It seemed to me that they should have been shut off long ago. There were plenty of rooms in the resort, but naturally I didn't have time to look through them all. The few I did peer into were similarly wrecked, and I didn't expect to find anything there. I thought there was actually a television or radio in one room, as I really think I heard a quiet conversation coming out. Though it was like a whisper, probably my own breathing echoing into the silence, or just another case of the sound of flowing water playing tricks on the mind. This is what it sounded like. sounds ridiculous. I'm just telling you what I experienced, why I thought there might have been something running in that room, or worse, some vagrants who had rolled up there and probably would have knifed me. At the front doors of the palace again, I figured I hadn't found anything of note, and it wasted the trip up. As I looked out the door, I noticed something interesting in the Something that would give me at least one thing to show for all my trouble, even if it was just a photograph. There is a lifelike statue of a python, maybe 80 feet long, coiled up and sunning itself on a pedestal right in the center of the area. It was almost time for the sun to start setting, so the light fell onto the object in the perfect way for a photograph. I approached the python and snapped a photo, then I stood on my toes and snapped another. I moved closer again to get the detail of its face. Slowly, casually, the python lifted its head, looked directly into my eyes, turned, and slithered off the pedestal, across the grass, and into the trees, all eighty feet of it. Its head long disappeared into the woods before its tail even left the sunning spot. Disney had released all their exotic animals onto the grounds. Right there on my floor plan map was the reptile house. I should have known. I'd read about the sharks at Treasure Isle, and I should have known they'd done this. I was dumbfounded, just utterly stupefied. My mouth must have been hanging open for the longest time before I came back down to earth and snapped it shut. I blinked a few times and backed away from where the snake had been, back toward the palace. Even though it was totally gone, I still wasn't taking any chances and backed my way into the building. I took a few deep breaths and slaps to my face to get myself right in the head. a place to sit down, as my legs were feeling a bit like jelly at this point. Of course, there was no place to sit down unless I wanted to recline on the broken glass and dead leaf carpet, or haul myself up onto a desk of questionable real reliability. I had seen some stairs near the palace's lobby, and decided to go have a seat there until I felt better. 
The staircase was far enough away from the front of the building to be relatively clean, save for a startling accumulation of dust. I pulled a wedge of metal off the wall, once again painted with the Abandoned by Disney motto I had become accustomed to. I placed the wedge on the stairs and sat on it to keep it at least somewhat clean. The stairway led downward, below ground level. Using my camera flash as a sort of improvised flashlight, I could see that the staircase ended in a metal mesh door with a padlock. A sign on the door, a real sign, read, Cast Members Only. This perked up my spirits a little bit for two reasons. One, an employees-only area would definitely have had some interesting stuff back in the day. Two, the padlock was still in place. Nobody had gone down there. Not the vandals, not the looters. Nobody. This was the one place I could actually explore, and perhaps find something interesting to photograph or wantonly steal. I had come to the palace essentially agreeing with myself that it was okay to take anything I wanted because hey, it was abandoned. It didn't take much to bust the lock. Well, actually, that's wrong. It didn't take much to bust the metal plate on the wall that the padlock was hooked to. Time and decay had done most of the work for me, and I was able to bend the metal plate enough to pull the screws out of the something nobody else had apparently thought of, or hadn't been able to do at the time. The cast members only area was a startling and very welcome change from the rest of the building I'd seen. For one, every second or third fluorescent light overhead was illuminated, even though they flickered and faded randomly. Also, nothing had been stolen or broken, even if age and exposure were deafening. Tables had notepads and pens, there were clocks, even a punch-in clock on the wall, complete with filled-out time cards. Chairs were scattered around, and there was even an old, small break room with a static-filled television and long, rotted out food and drink on the counters. It was like one of those post-apocalypse movies where everything is left in the state as I walked in the maze-like sub-basement hallways of the cast members only area, the sight just became more and more interesting. As I went further, desks and tables were knocked over, papers scattered and almost melted with the damp floor, and a large carpet of mold was slowly overtaking the real rotting crimson floor covering. Everything was just sort of squishy. Anything would disintegrated into mush when I applied even the least amount of force. And clothing items hanging on hooks in one of the rooms simply fell to moist threads if I tried to unhook them. One thing that annoyed me was that the light was becoming more sparse and unreliable as I went further into the dank, suffocating depths of the palace. Eventually, I reached a black and yellow striped door with the words Character Prep 1 stenciled on it. The door wouldn't open at first. I figured that this was probably where the costumes were kept, and I definitely wanted a photograph of that twisted, stinking mess. Try as I might, whatever angle or trick I tried, the door wouldn't budge. That is, until I gave up and started to walk away. That was when there was a slight popping sound and the door creaked open slowly. Inside, the room was completely dark, pitch black. I used the camera flash to look for a light switch in the wall by the door, but there was nothing. As I made my search, I was jarred out of my sense of excitement by a loud electrical buzz. Rows of lights overhead suddenly flashed to life, flickering and fading in and out like the rest of it took a second for my eyes to adjust, and it seemed like the light was just going to keep getting brighter until all the bulbs exploded. But just when I thought it would reach that critical stage, the light 
lights dimmed a bit and steadied. The room was exactly as I had pictured it. Various Disney costumes hung on the walls, fully put together, like strange cartoon cadavers hung from invisible nooses. There was an entire rack of loincloths and native clothes on hangers toward the back. What I found odd, and what I wanted to photograph right away, was a Mickey Mouse costume in the center of the room. Unlike the other costumes, it was lying on its back in the center of the floor, like a murder victim. The fur on the costume was rotten and shedding, creating bare patches. What was even odder, however, was the coloring of the costume. It was like a photo negative of the actual Mickey Mouse. Black where he should be white, and white where he should be black. His normally red overalls were light blue. The sight was off-putting enough that I actually put off photographing the thing until last. I took a picture of the costumes hanging on the walls angles, downward angles, side shots, to show an entire row of frozen future cartoon faces, some with plastic eyes missing. Then I decided to stage a shot. Just one of the bedraggled character heads on the slick, grimy floor. I reached for the headpiece of a Donald Duck costume and carefully removed it so the thing wouldn't fall apart in my hands. As I looked into the face of the wide-eyed, moldering head, a loud, clattering sound made me jump with fright. I looked down at my feet, and there, between my shoes, was a human skull. It had fallen out of the mascot head and shattered into pieces at my feet. Only the empty face and lower jaw remained, staring. I dropped the duck head immediately, as you'd expect, and moved for the door. As I stood in the doorway, I looked back to the skull on the floor. I had to take a picture of it, you know? I, I just had to. For any number of reasons that may seem silly, but only if you don't think it through. I need pr I needed proof of what happened, especially if Disney was going to somehow make this go away. I had no doubt in my mind, right from the start, that even if it was just gross negligence, Disney was responsible for this. That's when Mickey, that photo negative opposite Mickey in the middle of the floor, started to get up. First sitting up, then climbing to its feet, the Mickey Mouse costume, or whoever was inside of it, stood there at the center of the room, its fake face just staring directly at me as I mumbled, no, 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 no. With shaking hands, a violently thrashing heart, and legs that had once again turned to jelly, I managed to lift the camera and aim it at the opposite creature, now quietly sizing me up. The digital camera's screen displayed only dead pixels in the shape of the thing. It was a perfect silhouette of the Mickey costume. As the camera moved in my unsteady hands, the dead pixels spread, marring the screen wherever Mickey's outline moved to. Then the camera died, went blank, quiet, and broken. I raised my eyes once again to the Mickey Mouse costume. said in a hushed, perverted, but perfectly executed Mickey Mouse voice. Wanna see my head come off? It started to pull at its own head, working its clumsy glove-clad fingers around its neck with clawing, impatient movements similar to a wounded man trying to pull himself free of a predator's jaws. As it worked its digits into its neck, so much blood. So much thick, chunky, yellow blood. I turned away as I heard a sickening tearing of cloth and flesh. I only cared about getting away. Above the doorway, out of this room, I saw the fire.
final message clawed into the metal with bone or fingernails. Abandoned by God. I never got the pictures out of the camera. I never wrote the blog entry about it. After I ran from that place, I fled for my sanity, if not my very life. I knew why Disney didn't want anyone to know about this place. They didn't want anyone like me getting in. it for Abandoned by Disney. Hope you like that. And while this one was definitely more gruesome than Psychosis was, No End House is perhaps even more gruesome than this one. So if this was perhaps too much for you, now might be a good time to stop listening. But if you think you're good to go, please, by all means, continue listening to my very relaxing So, next is No End House. So, here we go. Let me start by saying that Peter Terry was addicted to heroin. We were friends in college and continued to be after I graduated. But notice that I said I. He dropped out after two years of barely cutting it. After I moved out of the dorms and into a small apartment, didn't see Peter as much. We would talk online every now and then. AIM was a king in pre-Facebook years. There was a period where he wasn't online for about five weeks straight. I wasn't worried. He was also a pretty notorious flake and drug addict, so I assumed he just stopped caring. Then, one night, I saw him log on. Before I could initiate a conversation, he sent me a message. David, man, we need to talk. That was when he told me about the No End House. It got that name because no one had ever reached the final exit. The rules were pretty simple and cliche. Reach the final room of the building and you win $500. There were nine rooms in all. The house was located outside the city, roughly four miles from my house. Apparently Peter had tried and failed. He was a heroin and who knows what addict, so I figured the drugs got the best of him and he wigged out at a paper ghost or something. He told me it would be too much for anyone, that it was unnatural. I didn't believe him. I told him I would check it out the next night and no matter me otherwise. Five hundred dollars sounded too good to be true. I had to go. I set out the following night. When I arrived, I immediately noticed something strange about the building. Have you ever seen or read something that shouldn't be scary, but for some reason a chill crawls up your spine? I walked toward the building, and the feeling of uneasiness only intensified. My heart slowed and I let a relieved sigh leave me as I entered. The room looked like a normal hotel lobby decorated for Halloween. A sign was posted in place of a worker. It read, Room 1, this way, eat more follow, reach the end, and you win. I chuckled and made my way to the first door. The first area was almost laughable. The decor resembled the Halloween Isle of a Kmart, complete with sheet ghosts and animatronic zombies that gave a static growl when you got passed by. At the far end was an exit. It was the only door besides the one I had entered through. I brushed through the fake spider webs and headed for the second room. I was greeted by fog as I opened the door to room two. The room definitely upped the ante in terms of technology. Not only was there a fog machine, but a bat hung from the ceiling and flew in a circle. Real scary. They seemed to have a Halloween soundtrack that one would find in a 99 cent store, 
on loop somewhere in the room. I didn't see a stereo, but I guess they must have used a PA system. I stepped over a few toy rats that wheeled around and walked with a puffed chest across to the next area. I reached for the doorknob and my heart sank to my knees. I did not want to open that door. A feeling of dread hit me so hard I could barely even think. Logic overtook me after a few terrified moments, and I shook it off and entered the next room. Room 3 is when things began to change. On the surface, it looked like a normal room. There was a chair in the middle of the wood paneled floor. A single lamp in the corner did a poor job of lighting the area, casting a few shadows across the floor and walls. That was the problem. Shadows. Plural. With the exception of the chairs, there were others. I had barely walked in the door and I was already terrified. It was at that moment that I knew something wasn't right. I didn't even think as I automatically tried to open the door I came through. It was locked from the other side. That set me off. Was someone locking the door as I progressed? There was no way I would I would have heard them. Was it a mechanical lock that set automatically? Maybe, but I was too scared to really think. I turned back to the room and the shadows were gone. The chair's shadow remained, but the others were gone. I slowly began to walk. I used to hallucinate when I was a kid, so I wrote off the shadows as a figment of my imag imagination. I began to feel better as I made it to the halfway point of the room. I looked down as I took my steps, and that's when I saw it. Or didn't see it. My shadow wasn't there. I didn't have time to scream. I ran as fast as I could to the other door and flung myself with The fourth room was possibly the most disturbing. As I closed the door, all light seemed to be sucked out and put back into the previous room. I stood there, surrounded by darkness, not able to move. I'm not afraid of the dark, I never have been, but I was absolutely terrified. All sight had left me. I held my hand in front of my face, and if I didn't know what I was doing, I would never have been able to tell. Darkness doesn't describe it. I couldn't hear anything. It was a dead silence. When you're in a soundproof room, you can still hear yourself breathing. You can still hear yourself being alive. I couldn't. I began to stumble forward after a few moments, my rapidly beating heart the only thing I could feel. There was no door in sight. Wasn't even sure there was one this time. The silence was broken by a low hum. I felt something behind me. I spun around wildly but could barely even see my nose. I knew it was there though. Regardless of how dark it was, I knew something was there. The hum grew louder. Closer. It seemed to surround me. But I knew whatever was causing the noise was in front of me inching closer. I took a step back. I had never felt that kind of fear. I can't really describe true fear. I wasn't even scared I was going to die. I was scared of what the alternative was. I was afraid of what this thing had in store for me. Then the lights flashed for a second, and I saw it. Nothing. I saw nothing, and I know I saw nothing there. The room was again plunged in the darkness, and the hum became a wild screech. I screamed in protest. I couldn't hear this sound for another minute. I ran backwards, away from the noise, and fumbled for the door handle. I turned and fell into room 5. Before I describe room 5, you have to understand something. I am not a drug addict. I have no history of drug abuse or any sort of psychosis short of the childhood hallucinations I mentioned earlier. And 
Those were only when I was really tired or just waking up. I entered the no-end house with a clear head. After falling in from the previous room, my view of room 5 was from my back, looking up at the ceiling. What I saw didn't scare me, it simply surprised me. Trees had grown into the room and towered above my head. The ceilings in this room were taller than the others, which made me think I was in the center of the house. I got up off the floor, dusted myself off, and took a look around. It was definitely the biggest room of them all. I couldn't even see the door from where I was. Various brush and trees must have blocked my line of sight with the exit. Up to this point, I figured the rooms were going to get scarier, but this was a paradise compared to the last room. I also assumed whatever was in room 4 stayed back there. I was incredibly wrong. As I made my way deeper into the room, I began to hear what one would hear if they were in a forest. Chirping bugs and the occasional flap of birds seemed to be my only company in this room. That was the thing that bothered me the most. I heard the bugs and other animals, but I didn't see any of them. I began to wonder how big this house was. From the outside, when I first walked up to it, it looked like a regular house. It was definitely on the bigger side, but this was almost a full forest in here. The canopy covered my view of the ceiling, but I assumed it was still there, however high it was. I couldn't see any walls either. The only way I knew I was still inside this house was that the floor matched the other rooms, the standard dark wood paneling. I kept walking, hoping that the next tree I passed would reveal the door. After a few moments of walking, I felt a mosquito fly up to my arm. I shook it off and kept going. A second later, I felt about ten more land on my skin at different places. I felt them crawl up and and legs, and a few made their way across my face. I flailed wildly to get them all off, but they just kept crawling. I looked down and let out a muffled scream, well, more of a whimper to be honest. I didn't see a single bug. Not one bug was on me, but I could feel them crawl. I heard them fly by my face and sting my skin but I couldn't see a single one. I dropped to the ground and began to roll wildly. I was desperate. I hated bugs, especially ones I couldn't see or touch. But these bugs could touch me, and they were everywhere. I began to crawl. I had no idea where I was going. The entrance was nowhere in sight, and I hadn't even seen the exit. So I just crawled my skin of these phantom bugs. After what seemed like hours, I found the door. I grabbed the nearest tree and propped myself up, mindlessly slapping my arms and legs to no avail. I tried to run, but I couldn't. My body was exhausted from crawling and dealing with whatever it was that was on me. I took a few shaky steps to the door, grabbing each tree on the way for support. coming from the next room, and it was deeper. I could almost feel it inside my body, like when you stand next to an amp at a concert. The feeling of the bugs on me lessened as the hum grew louder. As I placed my hand on the doorknob, the bugs were completely gone, but I couldn't bring myself to turn the knob. I knew that if I let it go, the bugs would return. just stood there, my head pressed against the door marked six, and my hand shakily grasping the knob. The hum was so loud, I couldn't even hear myself pretend to think. There was nothing I could do but move on. Room six was next, and room six was hell. I closed the door behind me, my eyes held shut and my ears ringing. The hum was surrounding me. As the door clicked into place, the hum was
was gone. I opened my eyes in surprise, and the door I had shut was gone. It was just a wall now. I looked around in shock. The room was identical to room three, the same chair and lamp, but with the correct amount of shadows this time. The only real difference was that there was no exit door, and the one I came in through was gone. As I said before, I had no previous issues in terms of mental instability, but at that moment I fell into what I now know was insanity. I didn't scream. I didn't make a sound. At first, I scratched softly. The wall was tough, but I knew the door was there somewhere. I just knew it was. I scratched at where the doorknob was. I clawed at the wall frantically with my own hands, my nails being filed down to the skin against the wood. I fell silently to my knees. The only sound in the room, the incessant scratching against the wall. I knew it was there. The door was there. I knew it was just there. I knew if I could get past this wall. Are you all right? I jumped off the ground and spun in one motion. I leaned against the wall behind me and saw whatever it was that spoke to me. To this day, I regret ever turning around. It was a little girl. She was wearing a soft white dress that went down to her ankles. She had long blonde hair and the middle of her back and white skin and blue eyes. She was the most frightening thing I had ever seen. While looking at her, I saw something else. Where she stood, I saw what looked like a man's body, only larger than normal and covered in hair. He was naked from head to toe, but his head was not human, and his toes were hooves. It wasn't the devil, but that moment, it might as well have been. The form had the head of a ram and the snout of a wolf. It was horrifying, and it was synonymous with the little girl in front of me. They were the same form. I can't really describe it, but I saw them at the same time. They shared the same spot in that room, but it was like looking at two separate dimensions. When I saw the girl, I saw the form, and when I saw the form, I saw the girl. I couldn't speak. I could barely even see. My mind was revolting against what it was attempting to process. I had been scared before in my life, and I had never been more scared than when I was trapped in the fourth room. But that was before room six. I just stood there, staring at whatever it was that spoke to me. There was no exit. I was trapped here with it. And then it spoke again. David, you should have listened. When it spoke, I heard the words of the little girl, but the other form spoke through my mind in a voice I won't attempt to describe. There was no other sound, the voice that just kept repeating that sentence over and over in my mind, and I agreed. I didn't know what to do. I was slipping into madness, yet couldn't take my eyes off of what was in front of me. I dropped to the floor. I thought I had passed out, but the room wouldn't let me. I just wanted it to end. I was on my side, my eyes wide open and the form is staring down at me. Scurrying across the floor in front of me was one of the battery-powered rats from the second room. The house was toying with me, but for some reason, seeing that rat pulled my mind back from whatever depths it was headed to. And I looked around the room. I was getting out of there. I was determined to get out of that house and live and never think about this place again. I knew this room was hell and I wasn't ready to take up a residency. At first it was just my eyes that moved. I searched the walls for any kind of opening. The room wasn't that big so it didn't take long to soak up the entire layout. The demon still taunted me, the voice growing louder as the form stayed rooted where it stood. I blew 
placed my hand on the floor, lifted myself up to all fours, and turned to scan the wall behind me. Then I saw something I couldn't believe. The form was now right at my back. rectangle was scratched into the wood, with a small dent chipped away in the center of it. Right in front of my eyes, I saw this large seven I had mindlessly etched into the wall. I knew what it was. Room seven was just beyond that wall where room five was moments ago. I don't know how I had done it. Maybe it was just my state of mind at the time, but I had created the door. I knew I had. In my madness, I had scratched it into the wall when I needed the most, an exit to the next room. Room 7 was close. I knew the demon was right behind me, but for some reason it couldn't touch me. I closed my eyes and placed both hands on the large 7 in front of me. I pushed. I pushed as hard as I could. The demon was now screaming. Chests facing me. The most un- 
family room, but I was in room seven. The faces of my parents smiled wider as I realized this. They weren't my parents. They couldn't be, but they looked exactly like them. The door marked eight was across the room behind the mutilated bodies in front of me. I knew I had to move on, but at that moment I gave up. The smiling faces tore into my mind. They grounded me where I stood. I vomited again and nearly collapsed. Then the hum returned. It was louder than ever, and it filled the house and shook the walls. The hum compelled me to walk. I began to walk slowly, making my way closer to the door and the bodies. I could barely stand, let alone walk, and the closer I got to my parents, the closer I came to suicide. The walls were now shaking so hard, it seemed as though they were going to crumble, but still the faces smiled at me. As I inched closer, their eyes followed me. I was now between the two bodies a few feet away from the door. The dismembered hands clawed their way across the carpet towards me. All will of faces continued to stare. New terror washed over me and I walked faster. I didn't want to hear them speak. I didn't want the voices to match those of my parents. They began to open their mouths and the hands were inches from my feet. In a dash of desperation, I lunged towards the door, threw it open, and slammed it behind me. Room 8. I was done. After what I had just experienced, I knew there wasn't anything else in this house that I could not live through. There was nothing short of the fires of hell that I wasn't ready for. Unfortunately, I underestimated the abilities of No End House. Unfortunately, things got more disturbing, more terrifying, and more unspeakable in Room 8. I still have trouble believing what I saw in Room 8. Again, the room was a carbon copy of Rooms 3 and 6, but sitting in the usually empty chair was a man. After a few seconds of disbelief, my mind finally accepted the fact that the man sitting in the chair was me. Not someone who looks like me. It was David Williams. I walked closer. I had to get a better look, even though I was sure of it. He looked up at me, and I noticed tears in his eyes. Please, please, please don't do it. P please don't hurt me. What? Who are you? I'm not going to hurt you. Yes, you are. You're going to hurt me, and I don't want you to. He sat in the chair with his legs up and began rocking back and forth. It was actually pretty pathetic looking, especially since he was me, identical in every way. Listen, who are you? I was now only a few feet from my doppelganger. It was the weirdest experience yet, standing there talking to myself. I wasn't scared, but I would be soon. Why are you? You're going to hurt me. You're going to hurt me. You're going to hurt me. I want you to leave. You're going to hurt me. Why are you saying this? Just calm down, all right? Let's try. I saw it. The David sitting down was wearing the same clothes as me, except for a small red patch on his shirt, embroidered with the number nine. You're going to hurt me, you're going to hurt me, please don't, you're going to hurt me. My eyes didn't leave that small number on his chest, 
I knew exactly what it was. The first few doors were plain and simple, but after a while they got more ambiguous. Seven was scratched into the wall, but by my own hands. Eight was marked in blood above the bodies of my parents, but nine, this number, was on a person, a living person. Worse still, it was on a person that looked exactly like me. David. Yes, you're going to hurt me. You're going to hurt me. He continued to sob and rock. He answered to David. He was me, right down to the voice. But that nine. I paced around for a few minutes while he sobbed in his chair. The room had no door, and similarly to room six, the door I came through was gone. For some reason, I assumed that scratching would get me nowhere this time. I studied the walls and floor around the chair, sticking my head underneath and seeing if anything was below. Unfortunately, there was. Below the chair was a knife. Attached was a tag that read, To David, from Management. The feeling in my stomach as I read that tag was something sinister. I wanted to throw up, and the last thing I wanted to do was remove that knife from under that chair. The other David was still sobbing uncontrollably. My mind was spinning into an attic of unanswerable questions. Who put this here, and how did they get my name? Not to mention the fact that as I knelt on the cold wood floor, I also sat in that chair, sobbing in protest of being hurt by myself. It was all too much to process. The house and the management had been playing with me this whole time. My thoughts, for some reason, turned to Peter, and whether or not he got this far. If he did, if he met a Peter Terry sobbing in this very chair, rather rocking back and forth. I shook those thoughts out of my head. It didn't matter. I took the knife from under the chair, and immediately the other David went quiet. David, what do you think you're going to do? I lifted myself from the ground and clenched the knife in my hand. David was still sitting in the chair, though he was very calm now. He looked up at me with a slight grin. I couldn't tell if he was going to laugh or strangle me. Slowly, he got up from the chair and stood, facing me. It was uncanny. His height and even the way he stood matched mine. I felt the rubber hilt of the knife in my hand and gripped it tighter. I don't know what I was planning on doing with it but I had a feeling I was going to need it. No. His voice was slightly deeper than my own. I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to hurt you, and I'm going to keep you here. I didn't respond. I just lunged and tackled him to the ground. I mounted him and looked down, knife poised and ready. He looked up at me, terrified. It was like I was looking in a mirror. Then the hum returned, low and distant, though I still felt it deep in my body. David looked up at me as I looked down at myself. The hum was getting louder, and I felt something inside me snap. With one motion, I slammed the knife down into the patch on his chest and ripped down. Blackness fell on the room, and I was falling. The darkness around me was like nothing I had experienced up to that point. Room 4 was dark, but it didn't come close to what was completely engulfing me. I wasn't even sure if I was falling after a while. I felt weightless, covered in dark. Then a deep sadness came over me. I felt lost, depressed, and suicidal. The sight of my parents entered my mind. 
the final room. And that's exactly what it was. The end. No end house had an end. And I had reached it. At that moment, I gave up. I knew I would be in that in-between state forever. Accompanied by nothing but darkness. Not even the hum was there to keep me sane. I had lost all senses. disembodied and completely lost. I knew where I was. This was hell. Room 9 was hell. Then it happened. A light. One of those stereotypical lights at the end of the tunnel. I felt ground come up from below me and I was standing. After a moment or two of gathering my thoughts and senses, I slowly walked toward that light. As I approached the light, it took form. It was a vertical slit down the side of an unmarked door. I slowly walked through the door and found myself back where I started. The lobby of No End House. It was exactly how I left it. Still empty, still decorated with childish Halloween decorations. After everything that had happened that night, I was still wary of where I was. After a few more months of normalcy, I looked around the place trying to find anything different. On the desk was a plain white envelope with my name handwritten on it. Immensely curious, yet still cautious, I mustered up the courage to open the envelope. Inside was a letter. David Williams, congratulations, you have made it to the end of No End House. Please accept this prize as a token of great achievement. Yours forever, Management. With the letter were five $100 bills. I couldn't stop laughing. I laughed for what seemed like hours. I laughed as I driveway. I laughed as I opened my front door to my house, and I laughed as I saw the small ten etched into the wood. And that is it for tonight. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed that, whether you're entertained, terrified, relaxed, or Regardless, I, I would just like to say thanks for watching again. I think I already said that. But yeah, I will see you next time.